as a great party. At some point, antibodies are going to go down eventually below the baseline that you need for protection. There are exceptions, possibly, as I said, hepatitis A, HPV, maybe a few others, but these are the exceptions. Uh, yellow fever, of course, live vaccines, but these are the exceptions rather than the rule. So at some point, you need to induce new B cells to make new antibody-producing cells. And there, are, uh, there is only one way to do that. Once antibody persistence is outlasted, you have to induce and reactivate memory B cells. Where do you think this takes place? <laughs> yes, in the yellow box. Okay, so what happens? It happens exactly at the same place. In the germinal center here, which you know how it was elicited, you have two outputs. One is the one we just described, plasma cells, antibodies, eventually landing in the bone marrow. And the second one is becoming a memory cell. What exactly makes a B cell decide to become an antibody producing cell or a memory B cells? We have ideas, but we don't know exactly. These memory B cells, they migrate through the blood for a very narrow or short period of time. You can find them like seven days after uh, injection. But their aim, they are very smart, their aim is to go back where they know that antigen will eventually come back again. So they migrate to the blood and they return to the lymph node. At the T B cell border, where dendritic cells and, B cell and antigens will eventually arrive. And they sit there doing nothing, enjoying life, protecting no one, so having a memory, resting memory B cell is of no use to anyone. But it's the first step. They go there and they wait for a new encounter to, guess what, become activated, happy, and so on and so on. And then what happens is because you have these memory B cells there, the, the booster response, the anamnestic response, is going to be much higher, much faster, and last much longer. Because something happened, because a memory B cell is not the same as a naive uh, first year grade, first grade uh, B cells. It has gone through university. So it knows how to do things better, faster, longer, and, and everything. So once you understand this, of course, the essential factors that control the induction and the magnitude of memory responses have to be the same which control the induction of germinal centers. So antigen nature, dose, repertoire, so the vaccine antigen, the genetics, everything that you have seen, the first factor is generate as many good germinal center responses as you can. And to prime you for next week lecture, one of the limiting things we think occurs in infants is that germinal center responses are limited during the first months of life for many reasons, such that the responses do not last as long, are, are, are not as strong, and so on and so on. But there is a second factor to that, which is time. Memory takes time. So the vaccine schedule which is the time for memory cells to become better, will impact their capacity to make more and better quality antibodies. And this is illustrated here. If you give two doses of a vaccine at a short interval, let's say one month, I'm not talking three days, let's say one month, you have a primary wave of memory response, uh, uh, of primary response, and you have, again, a second, a second wave of primary response because you don't have yet many memory B cells sitting there. After the, one month after the first dose, you don't have many there. So mainly bringing back antigen is going to redo the same cycle again. But if you wait for four months, we can negotiate, but four months, three months plus, four months is a good average. If you wait for four months, then the illustration is that instead of having only like one resting memory B cells, you have a lot that are 
so they are more better equipped, ready to get excited, don't even need to go through the germinal center again because they know exactly what to do. So it's extremely fast and you will generate many more lifelong uh, plasma cells. So this is mediated essentially through the maturation of the uh, ability or affinity of the memory B cells for the antigen. And here I never know exactly how to do that, but let's say if this is the antigen and this is the B cell, and uh, I'm, I can only fit something like that. It's okay, I can fit. Okay, so this is like a naive cell or a memory uh, after getting into the first round. I can fit and I get to the bar and I make antibodies that recognize and uh, produce antibodies that bind to this stuff. Okay. But now if I become a, a memory B cells with a repair receptor that can bind much better. Sorry, I have to change the shape of the antigen, but because I can change this one, but you understand. Or I can do it the other way around if you want. This is not so good. This is much better. If the affinity, if the interaction becomes stronger, then of course everything will get be amplified because you have more crosstalk between B cells and T cells and everything goes to the higher level. And this is what we call affinity maturation. And this affinity maturation takes place, guess where? In the germinal centers, uh, as essentially, at least this is where it started, and it takes several months. So the classical best immunization schedule is zero, one, six months. Z one or two doses for priming, one dose if you have a good antigen, let's say, that generates enough B cells to protect you for some time and enough memory cells. Two doses if it's not such a strong antigen, three doses if you're an infant and so on. Then wait, like when you do kitchen, it's better if you wait for a little bit, and then boost. And so the mantra I would like you to get a home with is prime, prime, boost, prime, prime, boost. Big prime, prime boost, because first it's a nice <laughs> tempo to dance anything on, and you can hear, rehearse, rehearse, repete, <laughs> rehearse, rehearse, I think, for the party next week. But then this is ex ev any, everything vaccinology is about prime and boost. And often you need to prime, prime, boost, prime, prime, boost, prime, prime, boost. I don't think you will ever forget that. <laughs> You see what, hap what, how much it helps to add memory? Better B cells, longer lasting responses, capacity to reactivate extremely faster. And so all that you will hear in the next, uh, uh, coming two weeks is how you can make the best effect of all this. And some of the lecture will, will target some parts and other will uh, other parts, but this is really with this basic you can fit everything in because it relates to something. Whatever uh, uh, will be discussed, I think, uh, uh, almost. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Catherine uh, from the UK. How do you know with any given vaccine at what point you have to restart a prime prime boost schedule versus when you can? Uh, continue if the second dose is missed or delayed. Thank you. That this goes back to a question where I said later. I think uh, uh, when I think you asked, uh, uh, so I will answer. You asked, what do do we do if children have missed doses? Okay. The answer is sorry to disappoint you, but the memory of your immune system is much better than the memory of your brain <laughs> or of your immune res immunization records. So the simple rule is catch up where it was stopped. So if you gave the first two doses, you generated antibodies for a while, then maybe this was 30 years ago. You generated memory B cells and they're still there waiting for antigen. Why would you give these two doses again? Memory B cells are there. All you need is to give the booster dose. So this makes life so easy. Never start all over again. It's never overcooked. There is one exception. Anyone knows it? 
bone marrow transplantation. Because then you have, before bone marrow transplantation, you, you have chemotherapy, which like wipes it off. And you don't have memory cells are a bit resistance, but not totally. So we like to say whenever you've had a bone marrow transplant for leukemia or, or anything that requires it, you need to re-immunize with diphtheria, tetanus, polio, and everything like if you were a child, even if you're an adult. But otherwise, it's never too late. Even 20 years? Yes. Even, even 40 years? Yes. Even 40 years. It, I don't know of a, a single example where it was shown that memory has really disappeared. That's the rule. Then we can discuss interesting example at the end of the day when we brainstorm a bit. But the rule is this, and you can really use it for your everyday life. Yes, please. Good morning. Matthias from WHO. Does the composition of the booster, is, is it different than the composition of the prime doses? The only thing it needs is to have an interchangeable antigen. So it can be a different platform. We've seen that with COVID. You can prime with RNA because these were the first available and then boost with a vector or the other way around or use now the protein adjuvanted vaccines uh, f- uh, to boost those who were primed. What is important is they all use the same spike protein. And in fact, you can use even protein alone to boost because uh, although this is not often done for uh, uh, retention reason and formulation reason, you don't need a lot of adjuvant because you don't need to activate the immune system anymore. The only thing you need is give antigen to the waiting B cells. So that makes it very easy. And, and so most vaccines are inter- interchangeable. And also another thing which I did not tell you but is making your life easy is um, memory cells when they migrate back to the lymph nodes they fortunately they don't migrate back only to the lymph node on the site where it was injected because my gosh if we had to remember in addition on which side you get which vaccine <laughs> i think i would have done another job okay so they migrate through the blood and then they see the lymph nodes everywhere so you don't have to have a column for right or left uh, wing uh, <laughs> uh, 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 injection Yes. Wow. No, I see many. I still have to go to T cells, but. All right. Sorry, sorry quickly. Prior no, no, that's fine. Pfizer. Um, when you're thinking of a multivalent vaccine with multiple antigens in a single shot, sometimes you mentioned about interference. From an immunological perspective, are there ways to overcome interference? Yes. Uh, interference is a very complex question. I think we could have a lecture at some point maybe uh, on vaccine interference because there are many ways that two vaccines can interfere. To stick with what I am delivering now, what is very difficult is to try to induce at the same time excitement against something as nice looking as this or boring as that. So if you have, for example, in a conjugate vaccine or in a multivalent vaccine, if you have something that is very strong, it's going to get a lot of attention and this one is going to get less. But at the same time, the T cell generated by this may help the others. So it really depends if this, cell, if this is a B cell antigen only, or if it's also a T cell antigen, and so on and so on. So there, are, there is a lot to interference, uh, and it it's, cannot be answered so easily. Um, I think it has to become more specific, and that's a question you can ask several times in the next two weeks, depending on the vaccine type, situations, and, and exactly what you're interested uh, into. Who has not yet asked a question today first? Yes, in the back, and then you. Yes. Thank you. Trina Lassin from Canada. Um, I was just wondering, it kind of following on the previous question, in the development of new broadly protective vaccines where, um, say, pan-coronavirus vaccine, yes. for example, if you're providing uh, to someone who's already been infected or vaccinated with the authorized vaccines, but your new vaccine also has components to things that they haven't seen before, how is that going to affect yeah. immune response? Yeah, that's a big problem. The dinosaur, as I am, they are fewer and fewer in the room every year, I notice. But the dinosaurs who founded that vaccine used to call that the original antigenic sin, which is a terrible word. Uh, but what does it mean? You never forget your, fir- your first love. <laughs> even if it, if, even if it was not the best, <laughs> you never forget it. Right? So unfortunately, 
if this was your first love and you get all excited and you make a lot of responses to it, and then you come with something that looks a bit like your first love, but not exactly. You still get excited by, by your first love much more. And it's difficult for the immune system to to really get to the point to see why would it, you know, you have memory B cells and everything against this. So to make antibodies or T cells to new epitopes when this is so attractive is difficult. So this is one of the key and difficult issue we have to face with viruses that changes all the time. Uh, and I think this is why I said get a natural booster uh, 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 because we are going to run to run after uh, eventually. I don't have a crystal ball, but but that's what it is. We see it. We saw it with we see it with the flu, and we can very clearly uh, show that the first strain of flu disease that you get as a child influences your responses to flu vaccine 50 years down the road. So if it was H1N1, you respond better to H1N1. If it was H3N2, you will respond better to H3N2 and so on and so on. And we see that with with uh, COVID and we'll see it with others as well. And then I said, yes. Maybe it's a silly question, but does it make sense if you uh, miss a dose like the second primary yes. dose? Would you then just skip the second prime in the oh. optimal, or would you? If you forgot to put the pepper or the salt, yeah. you add it. You add so it. if you but gave one yeah. only, then you give the second one, and then you have to wait for months to give the third one. That's the important, right? Mm -hmm. So even if the second dose comes ten years later, it still is the second primary dose. If it's a three dose schedule, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm talking a prime prime boost schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So start where it stopped and then follow whatever is recommended. Like following a recipe. Quite easy. Okay. Import burning questions. I see one in the back. And then I go to T-cells and then we may have some time for questions. Yeah, sorry. If, if my name no, is you Isaac. don't have to be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Isaac. Um, if you see a child at a clinic with active uh, measles infection, do you still need to vaccinate a child? Do I vaccinate a child with active measles infection? Yeah. No. And the reason is because measles is a very good suppressor of your immune system. So measles disease uh, dampens, weakens your immune responses for weeks, probably months. And this is why we have super infections and so on and so on. So for sure, I would wait until for a month until he recovers and then before I giving a vaccine. Now, if you're doing a campaign, you don't know the child is infected. If he's incubating, but you don't know, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to kill him, right? But the vaccine response is not going to be as good. So if I know a child has a, has a, a measles infection, I will not give him any vaccine. In fact, if I know a child has an infection in our countries, I usually will say, come when he's feeling well, because I don't want the vaccine to be blamed for anything that in fact results from infection and not from the vaccine. And I also don't want to think like otitis is getting worse because of fever, but in fact, fever is from the vaccine and so on and so on. So as a pediatrician, we like to say, come in a week, not in a month, because they never come in a month. Come next week. Okay. Good. So T cells are important and there are two types of T cells which uh, uh, do many different things. CD4 and CD8 T cells. CD4 T cells essentially we talked about already, they support B cell function. T cell helper cells are the most important, but they also do many other things. I will show you a slide for those who want to know more. And CD8 T cells, I believe Rafi Ahmed is going to talk more and you will have a specific lecture on CD8 T cell vaccines. I don't know where, uh, later in this week, I think, by, uh, uh, Daniel Pinchever. So you will hear, uh, uh, about, uh, this in depth. Essentially, the role of T cells is to attack antigens or viruses or bacteria that have, es that cannot be attacked by antibodies anymore because they have hidden within a cell. If, um, if this is the virus, I can bind to it as long as it's running around, but as soon as it's hidden into a cell, there is no way I can clear it. 
So the termination of infection, what we call clearance, is done by T cells and other cells. But you have to destroy the infected cells, and, and we need absolutely these, these cells. And there are very interesting questions. We'll get in to that later today about the relative role of T cells, uh, uh, of course, against intracellular pathogens. So if uh, uh, MTB is within a cell, this is within a cell. This is why I said antibodies are not going to be very helpful. But also the relative role of antibodies versus T cells into some infection versus complications and all that. This is interesting to discuss. So. The good thing is what you learn with B cells is also true, the basic principle with T cells. You have a peak, a decline, and a disappearance. There are differences, though. B cells, I did not mention it, it's not critical to know, but they are essentially naive B cells are produced in the bone marrow. And then they circulate in the blood, and then they get attracted to where you injected the vaccine, blah, blah, blah. T cells are produced in the thymus. Uh, this is important because this is where they learn self, non-self uh, discrimination. And you will hear about that when, when we discuss autoimmunity, like not attacking yourself if possible, but defending yourself against uh, pathogens. These T cells then migrate into the lymph nodes and then they expand. And uh, this is shown here because sometimes some ask, what is important is that... Um, T cells do not bind to the antigen itself, like B cells. This is the antigen, this, or this is the antigen, this is a B cell binding directly to the antigen. T cells can't do that. T cells have specific receptors. Next year, I will ask for different color glasses. So this is a T cell receptor. It's an, we call it HLA. You heard that word, uh, a molecule. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, um, sorry, antigen presenting cells have HLA molecules on their surface. And what they do, you, so, you see it here. The antigen is swallowed by the, the, by dendritic cells. It is chunked into small peptides, so strings of amino acids. And then it is presented on, this, this is HLA in, for, in humans into it presented to the T cell receptor of CD4 or CD8 T cells. And so it is at the same place in the germinal, in the lymph node at the T cell B cell border, uh, also eventually in tissue, of course, that you can induce either uh, CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells, and they have various roles and fu function. And for the aficionados, this is just an example of the many type of T cell subsets, CD4 T cell subset you can have with their, with their roles, some regulate, uh, uh, inflammation, some promote inflammation, some play a role in, uh, allergic responses and so on and so on, depending on the type of cytokines that they produce. And uh, whether you induce a TH1 or a TH2 or a follicular T cells depends on the type of cytokines uh, uh, which was present in the milieu where they were elicited. So at the T cell, B cell border. So it depends on adjuvant, uh, for example, or, or on the platform. This is really for those who want upper level. And the uh, vaccine induced specific T cells exactly, but with the same mechanism that they induce B cells. The nature, the dose, the route of exposure. Uh, uh, for example, the skin is very good at inducing responses because there are many Lang Langeron cells uh, and, and it's a very fantastic route of uh, uh, immunization, subpopulation, and, and so on and so on. It's exactly the same thing. And the same is true for CD8 T cells. There is not only one family, one type of CD8 T cells. There are many cousins. Uh, uh, now they are called TC1, TC2, TC. I don't know why they skipped three, four, five. In fact, uh, because uh, because those who make uh, IL-9 essentially very fancily are called TC9, and those who make IL-17 are called TC17. This is for the aficionados. If you need to induce a specific cytokine because your pathogen clearance would benefit from the cytokine, you will try to manipulate everything that comes better to induce, to favor the induction of this type of, of uh, subset. And it may make a big difference for some uh, pathogens that yet escape or, um, or uh, uh, vaccines. And as for B cells, most of the T cells will die, sorry for them, 
and a few will become memory T cells and they will wait to be reactivated. <laughs> the only difference is there are two types of memory T cells. Some memory T cells are really the lazy one. They found the best places where, you know, sun and nothing else, just sun, C maybe, uh, doing nothing, sitting there in uh, uh, the, the bone marrow, in lymph node, just waiting for antigen. And others run around pre-activated, like they are the, really the sentinel, uh, ready to rapidly interfere with something that would come in. And th these are called the effector memory T cells. Again, this is something that you don't need to uh, uh, remember, but uh, some may want to know. So, in a nutshell, how are vaccine response elicited? As easily as said, all you need is to induce a good enough innate reaction at the site of injection for B and T cells to be generated, migrate into the lymph node, get to the party, to the germinal center, get all excited, do what they have to do, define who is going to become a memory B cell, who becomes a long-lived plasma cell, craved to try to become a long-lived plasma cell because that's the best place in the world. You only have to spit out your antibody forever and live and live happily uh, there. Or become a memory B cell or T cells and wait for antigen to again reactivate your immune system. So from the injection, with a little bit of pain sometimes, you get everything you need to get into good effector uh, responses because you have specific antigen B and T cells. And this is really, I think, the basic of uh, what is sufficient to understand to use vaccines, whether it's for public health programs, because you can start to think about when is it best to boost? Do I need to boost? What is the best age to give an, a vaccine? What is the best vaccine? And so on and so on. So I think to me, this is the these are the key elements that uh, that uh, I wanted to convey. And of course, uh, uh, before I take your questions and we'll have time for questions, that's fine. Um, before you ask, I could ask, you know, how much antibodies do you need? How many T cells? Which type of T cells? What is the threshold? Blah, 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 blah. This depends on the pathogen. And so the most important talk is correlates of protection. But you cannot understand correlate of protection, which means what type of immune responses do you need to protect against what until you know what you how to trigger specific B and T cell responses and specific uh, uh situations. So so this is why I say I'm just warm, warming up the room for others to then tell you how it works differently or similarly when it's in the mucosal compartment, when it's when it correlates with this or this or that. And uh, I think I would like to, uh, uh, there are a few more slides uh, that I will not uh, share because they are not uh, that critical. It's about which type of assays can you uh, use to measure BNT cells. Uh, those who want to know more or read again or read this in a different manner, uh, you can uh, have this um, this chapter uh, that is uh, in Moodle. And I think now we have 15 minutes. This is really fancy uh, to uh, to take any questions on anything that we've discussed today. Eventually, I will say next week or next lecture if I know that someone is going to cover it exactly. Um, and I would like to first give uh, the mic to those who have not yet dared or have a chance to ask questions. So one, two, three, four, and then we'll go on this side. Yes. Thank you for that wonderful lecture. My name is Michael from Michael Erasing from Nigeria. So uh, where I come from, some authorities or pediatricians argue that if a child has had measles, confirmed measles, they don't need to vaccinate them again. So what's your opinion? Oh, I agree with that. If you, and uh, sorry if I misunderstood, but I don't think that was the question. If you have had measles or if you had had chickenpox, wild type viruses are much stronger in terms of eliciting immunity than attenuated viruses. So if you have had tick-borne encephalitis, if you had had yellow fever, you don't need any of, uh, any vaccine against this disease, if you know for sure. The difficulty is the diagnosis. So if in doubt, just shoot, give the shot. 
Uh, and what happens very often is, for example, someone uh, for sure he has not had uh, uh, measles or uh, not rubella, but has had mumps. You know it. Mm. But you don't have mumps vaccine anymore, right? You only have MMR. Mm. So what you do, you give MMR. Mm. What will happen? Question. What happens? I have had m mumps. So I have mumps. B cells, T cells, and antibodies. And I receive a mumps attenuated strain. What happens? Block. Not nothing, but almost nothing. Mechanistically, what happens? Eventually a boost if my antibodies went very, very, very low. But most of the time, my immune responses to the wild type strain are still there. So antibodies will just inactivate the vaccine immediately. Yeah. So in fact, this is very useful for parents who say, oh, I only want this vaccine, but not we have this type of parents in your community. Because don't worry, this is a la carte, not the menu. Your immune system is going to inactivate anything you don't need. If you already have antibodies to measles, the measles strain will be immediately neutralized. But rubella and mumps will take and induce their immune response. So I think you were second and so. Yeah. Um, my question is regarding the zero dose. Um, so yesterday there was a presentation on zero dose children who have not received a single dose of the recommended um, vaccines, depending on the calendar of that country. Let's say, for example, a child who was supposed to receive a three days of pentavalent vaccine. And then you see that child uh, like at the age of one year. Uh, how many doses would you recommend yeah. that child receive? You will have a I'm... special lecture on that next week. Okay. But the short answer is, in infancy, instead of prime, prime boost, you need prime, prime, prime boost. If you want to do it fast and done with some vaccine, prime, prime boost, for example, a PCV is enough because there are very good vaccines. But the younger you are, the more immature you are, the more doses you need. So if a child has not been immunized and you see him at one, two, five, or 10, you can use the adult like schedule. You can use prime, prime boost. So you will give two doses one month apart and then boost six months later for against tetanus, for example. And there will be a specific lecture on that. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes we do not also, have affinity maturation thanks. very well. Yes. So what are the conditions that um, affinity maturation doesn't happen very well and we are not faced with a neutralizing antibody? Huh. I, I wish I knew. <laughs> neutralizing antibodies are um, first directed to something that neutralizes. Mm -hmm. And so and neutralizing means preventing entry into the cell. Mm -hmm. So it has to bind to the uh, receptor that mediates that entry, right? So if that's the antigen and it's this finger that is the binding to the cell and it's like cropped, you will induce antibodies to everything but very difficultly to that one. So there are tons of answers. This is just one question. So in terms of why do we not always see neutralizing antibodies? Most of the time it's because the receptors are not well presented, the targeting receptor, the entry, uh, which prevent, pro, allow the entry into the cells are not well seen by the immune system, or it can be because you induce so many antibodies to this ticking one that this one is difficult to target, for example. So this brings us back to um, structure vaccinology, how to make a vaccine in which you, uh, I don't have enough finger, I don't know what to do with them, in which you have only this cropped finger that is you the receptors that you need for uh, to elicit neutralizing antibodies, for example, because then it would be really easy. That's one way. Affinity maturation is something that requires close T cell and B cell maturation uh, uh, interactions, and there are many, many, many parameters to that. Time is for sure one. So too quick is not good, like many things in life. When it takes more time, it's better. Okay. And yeah. Good morning. I'm Natasha from India. So, yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, my question is like uh, you said we can uh, pick up from where we have left. Yes. So why do vaccines have few vaccines have upper age limit? 
as there are no industry representatives in the room, nor regulatory representatives in the room, I will freely answer that the upper age limit strictly depends on the upper age of volunteers enrolled into the studies, which does not mean that a vaccine cannot be used before or after, just that the regulatory authorities have not received the files because the industry are not, has not generated or provided the files which regulatory authorities could use to say, we can use HPV vaccine until the age of 85. Whether it's useful or not depends on, you know, a number of uh, behaviors I don't want to have to comment upon. So that's the, that's the only reason. There, then there may be reasons of reactogenicity and things like that, but most of the time, 99%, it's data provided to the regulatory authorities. So in pediatrics, we know that very well. We are off-label all the time. When we have a kid whom we are going to, for example, born with uh, biliary atresia, uh, is deemed to have liver transplant on one year of age. We don't wait for until the age of one year to give him MMR, chicken pox, and everything, yellow fever, whatever. We give everything we can before because we know that after that, he would be immunosuppressed for life and these vaccines would be more risky and so on and so on. So we know, we know, and we do that all the time. So for us, it's easy. If you work in an institution, it's more difficult. If you work in a program, it's impossible because you need rules. Otherwise, every physician does his own immunization schedule, and it's a mess. Please. Then I'll go to the left. Um, Tabelo from Lesotho. I wanted to know what your thoughts are on vaccinating preterm infants. The current rule in my country... Is there that... will be a great lecture on preterm okay. infant okay. next week. All right. You will hear a pregnant woman, Janet England. You will hear preterm infants and infant with... Uh, uh, one of my successors, so it will be great. But the basic rule is the same as term infants. Do not correct for chronological age. Because what triggers the immune capacity maturation of the immune response is to be exposed to the external world. Hmm. So if that happens after seven months of gestation inter instead of nine, the counter start ticking whenever birth occurs. So at 60 days of age, he's eligible for his shot. So at six weeks, uh, six times seven, 42 days of age, he's eligible for the first dose, regardless of the um, term. That's the basic rule. Now I promise to go to the other side to those who have not yet asked any question and I'll go back from back to front. Yes, you please. Thank you. My name is Esther. Uh, I wanted to find out about oral vaccines like polio and... Uh, oh, stop. <laughs> Mucosal immunity. Next lecture. <laughs> okay. Thank That's you. Number, one, number two question, sorry. For varicella and TB, you say that they do not elicit a B-cell response um, when you give the vaccine. Why well, is well, can you say that again? I don't think I said for, that. For the TB and varicella vaccines, Yes. you say that uh, when you showed us that chart on chapter two... Uh, they do elicit antibodies, <laughs> but antibodies do not protect. Because if you're MTB, the first thing you do is enter into cells. And then if I have a vaccine that induces antibodies, I have a very limited time to catch this before it enters into a cell. Right? Mm, so okay. extracellular. Thank you. Please. So I'm Liana from India. So if there's an outbreak in an urban slum area for measles, and measles vaccines is usually given at nine months, and the child is only six months old, so what would be a recommendation to vaccinate or and then revaccinate at the age of nine months? Okay, this or is where I get in trouble. <laughs> because you're going to go back to India, talk to your prime minister of health, <laughs> and say, you know what, Clarence Sigrist told us that in Switzerland, if there is a risk of measles, we can give MMR at the age of six months, which is true, which is what we do. So we know it's safe. It has been given even earlier, little data, six months for sure, we know it's safe. So if there is a high risk of exposure, we recommend giving the vaccine. But this is a recommendation that has to be endorsed. So you have to, you know, see what you can make of it. But in terms of 
capacity of responding to the vaccine and mitigating the risk of complication. You may not prevent measles, but you're going to mitigate the risk of complication. What I would do then, however, is not forget that this child should have the normal measles doses after. Because if there are still a, a lot of maternal antibodies, and there will be a lecture on maternal antibodies around, so if you have all maternal antibodies against measles in the blood, and you get with a little bit of measles virus, the, the vaccine will not take. And when maternal antibodies will have disappeared and the virus comes again, the child is left without immunity. So that would be my question. I was well, still five minutes doing good. Who has not yet asked any question in this part? Yes, you. I think I heard you. Uh, yeah, no. definitely. It's yes, Raoul from uh, DR Congo. So I want to, to know that uh, we are using uh, at this time uh, immunosuppressor for yeah. treatments. In some, specifically in children. Yeah. Uh, can we reschedule the, the vaccination as they receive immunosuppressor or, or what happened for these doses? Is, is your question how should we adjust or adapt the vaccination uh, in children who are immunosuppressed? Yes. Yes. The question, uh, the answer is there will be a le full lecture on immunosuppression, <laughs> immunodeficient, HIV. And, and everything. So anything that, uh, why? Because every immunosuppressant has a different action. Some act on B cells, some are on T cells, so more on these, some are mild, some are strong, some are compatible with some vaccines, but not others and so on. So they, they don't give me enough time. I'm just here to prime. <laughs> so I'm giving the prime and you will have prime, prime, boost many times during the, year, the, the week, right? And the reason, and you will have answers to these questions. We adapt, of course. And this is why I said there are vaccines that we will give to a six months old, old child if we know that he's going to be strongly immunosuppressed for liver transplant soon. Uh, then there are immunosuppressive with which you can uh, generate, for example, if you have antibodies that prevent, monoclonal antibodies that prevent you from making B cells. You can get all doses of COVID or any vaccines that you want, but you will not make B cell responses, but you will still make T cell responses. And there are not that many studies, so we need you guys out to do studies in this population. Arnaud and others uh, uh, are doing this, and this is very important. What good do, does it do for a person who is under this or this or this type of immunosuppressant or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you know, all these spe specific populations to receive the vaccine, is it, is it useful or not? Is it a good m bet for money or uh, 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 cost efficacy or whatever? Is it positive? These are very interesting questions. So, one, two. Ladies first. Uh, Kristen Earl Gates Foundation. So, I am also very interested in measles, like many of my colleagues here. Um, I know we have some data to suggest that even in the absence of maternal antibodies, that the response to measles vaccination at earlier, uh, four, definitely four, but also at six months, can be inferior. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, and we always say that, you know, maturity of the immune, res immune response. Um, is, there something, is that for, would that be generalizable to all live attenuated vaccines or is there something specific about measles itself that you really need that additional maturation and no, get that better response? It is specific. specific to the, thank you for the question. It is specific to infancy. As human, we are born extremely dependent. We don't know how to walk. We don't know how to talk. We don't know how to recognize our mother, although we've heard her for months. Uh, and so on and so on. So, and this, and similarly, it takes time for our immune system to build its capacity to respond, to discriminate self from non-self, to discriminate what is dangerous from less dangerous, and so on and so on. And they are, these are us usually useful, uh, mechanisms because if you would start re uh, um, reacting strongly to everything you eat, to everything, every bug on your skin, every bug in your digestive tract or throat or whatever. I mean, you would be a bomb of inflammation, right? So the first year of life is regulated for immune response to be dampened. It's not that it's weak and that it doesn't function. It's regulated to be dampened such that you don't get too sick from inflammation. And then once you 
have recovered from this period, then you start with your immune response capacity. I still have 15 seconds uh, to take Dennis' questions. I see him getting close. Okay. So there is something to the specific to infancy, not to measles. Dennis, I think you had the, no? Okay. So who is dying, craving for a question? New gentleman and that's it. Yeah, thanks so much, Emmanuel. You talked about some of the factor that, factors that affect the duration of protection. Yes. I just wonder if there are studies that look at each of those specific factors and specific vaccines and how much of that has actually been used, especially in creating boosters or new vaccines. Thanks. That's, this is a very difficult question, isn't it? A general, I mean, there are so many factors. You're asking if there are studies that looked at every single factor within a study? The answer is certainly no. And what seems simple, the way I presented it, is that today, I hope it seems simple, time frame boost, the party and everything, is a result of many, 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 many decades now of studies and of putting things together. So you will hear, and I, I think at the end of the two weeks, you will have more insight into what you can try, what you can explore. But there is not one simple rule, not one magic vaccine, not one magic platform, not one magic adjuvant that will do the job. And this is why we have a vaccinology course every year, because we need your brains to think about the new generation vaccines. Thank you very much.